I started in ordained ministry here in the southwestern Minnesota Synod, I came to a synod assembly, and uh, it got to that time when the treasurer's report was going to be given, and I thought, oh good, here's a time for a nap. <laughs> that was until David Anfinson showed up. And uh, David came up and explained uh, the synod budget for the next year in such a way that it was interesting. So we were pleased when David accepted our invitation to uh, come to us and talk to us tonight about uh, things that are, he's passionate about, as you'll find out in a few moments. Uh, he serves, as uh, you can see, uh, at Anfinson Thompson uh, Accounting and uh, also Financial Services in Wilmer, Minnesota. And, um, uh, and we are pleased to have David speak with us tonight about his topic he called Surprise. Introverted treasurers positively affect stewardship. So we're interested in finding out about that, David. Welcome. Let's Thank welcome you. Well, good evening. They always put me in the middle between two theologians. You kind of wonder when they have the tax collector right in the middle, what they're trying to tell the tax collector. So my topic tonight is surprise introverted treasures positively affect stewardship. And the subtitle is Effectively Understanding and Communicating the Parable of the Church's Financial Life to the Pastor, Stewardship Committee, Finance Committee, Helps Build a Foundation of Generosity. Is this even possible? Is it even plausible? Well, let's figure it out together. You know what happens on Sunday? I have spent the week trying to be a good steward, and I'm reading my lessons for Sunday. And you know what happens? I get to a parable, and I read it, and I think I've got it. And you know what happens? I show up on Sunday, I'm all ready, and you know what my pastor does? He shatters my whole work for the week. He tells me, David, that wasn't exactly what it said. I have come to believe in the last 26 years working with congregations that our financial life, our annual reports, our financial statements, and those little box scores that we love to put in the Sunday bulletin about what happened with our financial life last week are parables. I believe we all read them differently. The finance committee, the stewardship committee, our congregation. And I hesitate to say it, but I also believe it to be true. Our treasurers and our pastors. We all read this differently. And I would be willing to bet that I'm not so sure as we're walking into the sanctuary and we're walking underneath our mission statement that we have any idea at all if our budget is representative of that missional statement. Here's what we're going to do. In front of you tonight, you have some paper. I want everybody to grab a piece of paper. They're blank. And what this represents is your congregation's financial budget. OK? All right. Now, before we go further, I should tell you this. My congregational clients, my children, and my bishop all believe that I fit very nicely and neatly into that typical, radical, rule-breaking, rebellious CPA mold. <laughs> okay? All right, so here we go. Hold them up. So th this month, when you show up to the council meeting and it's your turn to talk, this is what you're going to do. You're going to stand up and rip it. Rip it apart. Shred it. Be gone. 
Now, let's go back to Catherine. Does our anxiety level change? Don't we feel better? <laughs> it's gone. We don't have to talk about this thing anymore. I have come to believe there are three theories. Not hypotheses, but theories. Because a theory, remember from school, you kind of test out and see if it really works. I believe these to be theories. Theory number one. Numerical budgets stifle stewardship. Numerical budgets stifle stewardship. Number two, temporarily restricted giving. And we'll talk about what that is. Temporarily restricted giving stifles stewardship. And the third one, today's tax collector is your stewardship committee's best friend. Today's tax collector is your stewardship committee's best friend. So let's begin. If we've ripped up that budget, we have to start with something, do we not? Well, we need to replace it with something else. And that something else is a narrative budget. Not a numerical, but a narrative budget. There is a website, centerforfaithandgiving.org, that has some beautiful copyrighted material that I'm just going to read tonight. I can't do better than this. That talks about what a narrative budget is. The narrative budget, as the name implies, tells a story. The story is your congregation's story of mission and service and how the varying components of the budget contribute to that specific community of faith being able to live into its God-given vision. It connects every aspect of the budget to ministry. It links every dollar to mission and every gift to the faithful expression of the joy of giving and the generosity of our God. Narrative budgets inspire, interpret, encourage, challenge, and inform donors why their gifts matter. Does your annual report, your Sunday box scores, and your financial statements do any of that? They might, but I believe that they're really more parables. So now that we've ripped this thing up, what are we going to do? Because they're going to all look at you just like you're looking at me. Well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the next 30 days, and we are going to gather a team, perhaps the finance team, perhaps the stewardship team, and we are going to go around, and we are going to view everybody who is affected or uses our church. We're going to talk to the pastor. We're going to ask the pastor to tell us what they do, track their time. So what are they going to do during the day? They might spend time with the youth. They might direct a worship service. They might be working on missions. They might be representing us in the community. They might be doing bereavement support. They might do marriage counseling. We're going to have them track the time and how many people are in the groups that they're working with. We're going to talk to the ladies group. We're going to talk to the men's group. We're going to talk to the funeral group, the choir, the youth. We're going to talk to the AA group and the, and the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts who rent those rooms from us. We're going to talk to the men's Bible study and the ladies' Bible study. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to count people hours. So, for example, we go to the ladies' Bible study. There's five ladies in there. The Bible study is going to be an hour. They're all going to sit there for an hour. Five people, 
One hour for each, five times five is 25. 25 people hours. We're going to do this with everything that is happening inside our church. And then we are going to take those people hours and begin to move our expenses around to really see what missional statement is happening inside our church. We're going to see if the mission statement that we walk under really is being lived out inside our walls. Does our budget represent that? Then we're going to take these numbers. So we're going to take the pastor's salary and we're going to take the choir uh, director's salary and the benefits and we're going to take our heat and we're going to take our lights and we're going to allocate it throughout these categories based on people, hours. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a few categories that we can place these in. For example, we typically use the word benevolence. We might replace benevolence with supporting the wider mission of the church. We might go on to say other parts of our budget are reaching out to serve our community, preparing for conducting worship, educating our children, youth, and adults, caring for our church family, reducing our debt, equipping and maintaining our platform for mission. Now that we've got the categories, and now we've figured out the people hours, and how to allocate the money, you know what the next step is? We're going to go find the very best writers and wordsmiths in our congregation to begin to tell the story of what's happening in those categories. So again, Center for Faith and Giving gives us an example. Caring, care for our church family category with a dollar amount allocated to it, $25,000. And then we're going to tell the story. For example, pastoral care is a vital part of our work, especially for persons who are ill, hospitalized, bereaved, preparing for marriage, going through divorce, or facing other crises. Our church secretary provides information and other services to members, such as preparation of reports for the annual meeting of the congregation, our monthly newsletter, the church website, other public publications, our family game night, our church picnic, all fall within this category that enable us to sustain our common life together. We are telling the tale of what is happening inside our congregation. We are telling our missional statement of how we are spending our dollars. We are beginning to inspire, interpret, encourage, challenge, and inform our donors about why their gift matters. I believe, and I'm going to challenge you, that I believe how we currently do it with numerical budgets, numerical financial statements, and box scores in the bulletins on Sunday are nothing more than reports to shareholders. And we are the body of Christ. And we need to tell our missional story. Now, what, do I, what did I leave out? If you're listening, I left something out. Income. I haven't said anything about income. Now, this is not a requirement to do a narrative budget. However, for 26 years, those congregations I've worked with, most of them no longer budget income. Now, you thinking the bishop might be right about this radical CPA? <laughs> 
no longer budget income. And the congregations that I work with who have moved to this approach have received 100% of what they've needed. 100%. One of them for 15 years straight. They are telling the tale differently than a, a report to shareholders. We need to tell our missional story. Narrative budgets tell that story. Numerical budgets stifle stewardship. Temporarily restricted giving also, I believe, stifles stewardship. Temporarily restricted giving is this. Well, to do it, let's start at the beginning. We have unrestricted giving. What's unrestricted giving? I open up my pocketbook, I, fi I throw $5 into the collection plate, I put no restrictions on it. Church can spend it any way they want. Unrestricted giving. And then at the other end of the uh, uh, spectrum is permanently restricted giving. Doesn't have to, but more often than not, comes from I've passed away, I've given you a bequest, and I say, here's $25,000, you can only use it for missions, and you can only invest it in first mortgages and CDs at the local bank. You look at me with curiosity, we got one of those at my church. And then in the middle, temporarily restricted giving. So what's that? Well, it is a variety of things. It could be the choir decides they need a new handbell set. They decide the new handbell set costs $20,000. We go out, we get everybody to give, we raise $25,000, right? We go buy it for what? 20. We have how much left? Five. What do we do with the five? It just hangs there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just kind of hanging there. You know, we don't know what to do with it. The choir thinks that they might new, buy new handbells 20 years from now, and that's good seed money, so we're not going to touch that. Right? Or it might come in, you know, this happens a lot. People walk into the church office during the week and they think, you know, gee, we should go conquer the world. So we think a statue of Napoleon should be sitting in our church, you know, yard. So I'm going to give $10 for a statue of Napoleon. And what does the church office do? Well, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and now we've got it on the books. Statue of Napoleon, $10, and we're never going to spend it. <laughs> so the congregations that I work with, you know how many temporarily restricted assets on average they have? 135. We have pages of these things. You know how many they use? 10. So let me ask you this. Does remnants of past missional things that we've done, such as handbells, does statues of Napoleon, does any of those things tell our missional story that we are living out today? No. They no longer do. So I'm challenging you to create a policy with your stewardship group, with your finance group, of what restricted temporarily restricted assets you will receive and that you will then release that restriction when we have completed the task and the balance shifts to unrestricted because I believe temporarily restricted assets stifle stewardship. Last one, and we want to leave the room for questions. Today's tax collector is your stewardship committee's best friend. We all think stewardship starts at your committee at the church level. I agree. However, step two, I hate to tell you this, is that more often than not, people who want to give substantial gifts to the church, 
not that you think are substantial, but that they think are substantial. Whether it's $200, $500, $1,000 or $10,000, sit in my office before tax time and say, David, I'm thinking of giving $10,000 or $200 to the church. How does it affect me on my taxes? And you know where the decision is made? It's made in my office. And sometimes it's yes, and sometimes it's no. We have a litany of opportunities with our professionals, with our tax people, with our development people, with our investment people who can help us understand that ways that we can impact stewardship, where it, whether it is reducing the taxes that they owe from an estate or a possible estate to how they affect their taxes today, such as giving appreciated securities. There is a litany of ways. We can create charitable deductions that you can gain some income from and then leave the asset to the charity. There are ways to do this. You need to partner with these professionals to help you fully understand where we're at and how the tax preparer can be a positive influence in your church's stewardship life. So, three things. Narrative budgets stifle stewardship. No, I'm sorry. Numerical budgets stifle <laughs> stewardship. <laughs> Numerical budgets stifle stewardship. Temporarily restricted giving stifles stewardship. Today's tax collectors, your stewardship committee's best friend. Thank you. Thank you, David, for challenging us. And we have about seven minutes to uh, receive questions and comments for David, either online, and looks like Pete's ready. We're ready. We have one right off the bat. Are narrative budgets effective for bookie bookkeeping purposes and financial analysis? Narrative budgets are effective for those purposes because we still are going to do a sub piece of work that the bookkeeper is going to do. We're still going to collect those numbers because we need to understand those pieces. But our missional story the story that our congregation needs to hear and understand is woven through that missional narrative budget. And also, should a narrative budget tell the story of who we are or who we want to be? Well, that's where the challenge comes in. You know, there are multiple ways to do this. What I am suggesting, where we begin the process, is where we are currently spending our time. That is going to begin to tell us whether we are living into that mission statement that we have. But there are plenty of opportunities to enhance that budget by where we want to go. Okay. Any questions from in the room? Yeah, right here. Your final point about uh, these financial planners being a great person to partner with, each of us probably has multiple uh, financial planners within our congregations. Can you say more about how that partnership might look without seeming preferential? Well, I think what we really want to do is we gather a group of, of people, if they're in our congregation, that is absolutely wonderful, where we can begin to learn from them how people are coming into their offices talking about stewardship. You know, what does it mean to give? How can it affect my taxes, my personal situation? And how does it affect those who I want to leave assets to? So it might be talking with that group, um, learning from them, and you imparting your wisdom to them. It might be also inviting that development group there are people, you know, such as Luther Seminary, who do beautiful jobs with this, who really can enhance that collaborative conversation. Okay. Any other questions from in the room? Yes, thank you. So would you say that, would you say that the narrative budget would be the way to present your budget at your annual meeting? And you'll still have your numerical budget that you would work on, but when you present it, maybe at your annual meeting? <laughs> okay. 
answers the question. We are telling our story. We are not giving a report to shareholders. We want to tell our story, our missional story, at our annual meeting. Okay. Any other questions from in the room? If not, thank you very much. Thank you.